Welcome to Work Comp Talk, a podcast dedicated to all the injured workers here in California. My name is Carmen, your host, and this is the best of Work Comp Talk series where we highlight the best episodes from the podcast into one. I also wanted to give you a heads up. Season five is coming up. It's coming up pretty soon and I'm excited because I'm gonna be able to share so much more knowledge with you as I embark this new season along with many other co-hosts that are also attorneys for workers' compensation. So we're gonna get different views and different uh, concepts, different ideas that are gonna come from these other attorneys. And you'll also get to meet other great people that belong to Pacific Workers. So I hope you join us for this. And I also hope you like this best of a work comp talk. I'll catch you guys next time. And today's uh, topic is can you work while you're on workers comp? A lot of people get injured on the job and workers comp is notoriously crappy for providing benefits to people. I want to know what it, what happens if I get hurt and I need to work and earn income. I right. want to be able to pay my bills, pay my rent, my mortgage, support my children and be able to put gas in the tank and do things just to exist. So if a doctor says you shouldn't work at all, if you have a doctor that says your injury is so terrible, I don't even want you to have restrictions. You're just, you need to sit at home and have bed rest. That would be someone who's temporarily totally disabled, would be someone that has the ability to work in a limited capacity. When that happens, the employer has an obligation to determine whether or not they can accommodate those work restrictions. If the employer cannot accommodate those work restrictions, then the injured worker would be entitled to temporary disability pay. No, it's one or the other, unfortunately. Oh. You can't double dip. You can't work as unable to accommodate you and then go get another job and double dip and collect. And because of work restrictions, because of your injury, you can't work one of the jobs, then you are still allowed to keep the other job while collecting the temporary partial disability for the job that you cannot work. Note to self, make sure you have two jobs before you open your <laughs> workers' comp case. If you have two jobs and because of work restrictions or the injury and being on TD, you can't work either job, right. then the income from both jobs is actually taken into account when calculating your temporary disability rate. But there's still a cap. Most people exceed that cap if you're working two jobs. If you opt to take a new job, mm -hmm. then you have to notify the insurance company and they will terminate your injury and level of permanent disability is associated with uh, old injuries or pre-existing right. medical conditions and your new injury. There's Those no are... restriction on educating yourself well, on temporary disability. Good. You can go to school. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course not. <laughs> Tell us about some of the things from clients with this particular question, working while on TD benefits. A lot is what I think is commonly referred to now as side hustles. Ooh. And people have their little thing on their side that they've done pre-injury and now post-injury. Again, if it's something you're doing to earn money before, I've had quite a few clients, women who do hair and nails for fun, and they get paid because it's a family and friend thing. That's fine. You can continue to do that if you're on work restrictions and your employer can't accommodate those, but those aren't making your condition. And what you're doing on the side is within work restrictions and it's income you earned previously, you're fine. If you start taking up the hair and nail business, once you're temporarily totally disabled and you weren't doing that before and now you're earning an income off it, they'll hire private investigators. They follow you around. I think there was a firefighter, I want to say, that was a Los Angeles County employee who after he had settled his workers' comp case, they found out he had been teaching scuba diving lessons. Right. Yeah, so it's absolutely fraud. They'd rather spend thousands of dollars hiring a PI to not pay you instead of paying you because they'd rather just flat out say, no, you're cheating. It's ridiculous. They'll go all out for that, but they won't go all out when it's the other way around, <laughs> when they need to get shit together. And I get it. We don't support fraud. That's yeah, is, no, a, is a law firm. If a client's fraudulent, we won't represent them. We just don't think it's right morally. You know, we're, not, we're here to help legitimately injured people that do get busted for fraud. It's, you know, it is what it is. We shouldn't have been doing that, but it's true. And one thing we didn't touch on, um, but I think is an important distinction is permanent disability benefits. Permanent disability benefits are designed to compensate you for functional limitations from an injury that cannot be fixed. You can work and collect permanent disability at the same time. There is absolutely zero restrictions on that. You can get a new job, you can continue on your old job. There's no problem with that. They're making, they're paying for that extra money that you can't 
possibly make because of that impairment you now have to deal with. Say you lost a leg and you can no longer work in construction. Mm -hmm. so had you had two legs, you would probably be making more of a significant amount of money than working at Starbucks, per yeah. se. And PD, permanent disability, comes hand in hand with any new job that you decide to take. Permanent disability rates capped at $290 per week right now. And that <laughs> has not changed since 2014. And so my hope is that there will be some changes in the pipe to make up for some of the cost of living adjustments and wages, because obviously wages have gone up since 2014, yeah. including California minimum wage, for yeah. example. And so I think the permanent disability rates right now are, are archaic and don't adequately address loss of income. And permanent disability rates don't take into account specialized situations. For example, we used to represent a ton of professional athletes. Or a construction worker, you have a great union job, you're making good money. If you're a foreman or a supervisor, you've been at it for a while, but you can't do the work anymore. Maybe your permanent disability is not that much, but your work restrictions are a problem. You're out of a career, but it doesn't take into account the fact that you might have done this for the next 20, 30 years and it made a sucks. bunch of money. It I can, I can best. See that. Because believe it or not, it happens more often than not. How do you know what you are considered when you're working? Are you considered an employee? Are you considered a contractor? What the hell is your status in your job? And that's what we're going to be discussing. Bilal, mis misclassifications in workers' comp. No one thinks about it until you get injured and you're in a pickle. It happens all the time, unfortunately. Generally speaking, you can be an independent contractor, which means you pay your own taxes, you have deductions, you're usually your own business owner, things like that. You see a lot of businesses employ people, but they call them contractors because there's really financial benefits to the employer. The employer doesn't have to pay payroll tax. They don't have to provide you know, health benefits. They don't have to provide retirement accounts. They don't have to do much of anything. The biggest thing is they don't have to provide workers' compensation to independent contractors. However, the law was put into effect three years ago. That reset what it means to be an independent contractor versus employees. That case was Dynamex. And it basically said, if you're under the control of your employer and you're doing what that employer does, if you're an independent contractor, but you're a plumber for a plumbing business, you're not doing something separate and unique. You're really just participating in what the business is. Unfortunately, we still see every day that there's businesses misclassifying buying employees as independent contractors really to just try and skirt by and shave off costs. Technically, the person's doing work for me in my electronic company, but they're really your employees, the staffing agency. And that's another debate we get in all the time because there's a lot of corporations that staff people as temps or otherwise. And it's a debate who's actually liable for the injury. Is it the staffing company or is it the, the special employer where the, the person was placed? And really that depends on who's paying the bills. The staffing company is actually paying for the wages, the healthcare, all that. They are actually the primary party responsible for workers' comp. We'll get a client. They were a laborer at a construction site. They suffered, you know, a fall injury or something. Their employer takes them to the hospital, tells them, hey, say you fell at home, say it didn't happen at work. I'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. And then they say it happens at home. The doctor will treat them, but it's not enough. They're off work still or they get fired. And then the employer stops talking to them. Mm. Turns out they don't have work comp insurance. It's There's unfortunate and it happens all too often. Luckily, we go to bat for these people and more often than not, we kick butt and give them the benefits and medical they deserve, whether it's from the employer themselves or we go after what's called UEF, the Uninsured Employers Benefits Trust Fund, which is the state's version of insurance to protect injured workers in the event they are working for a shady employer that does not have workers' compensation insurance. So usually that's kind of like a slush fund that's there to pick up for the injured worker. And it doesn't mean it's a big fund, by the way. You are an employee. So you'll see those things on all your pay stubs. If you're an independent contractor, you may just be receiving a flat payment. You hmm. won't actually have things deducted. Employers aren't responsible for paying taxes for independent contractors. If you're not receiving proper pay stubs, you can sue for that. If you're owed overtime, meal period, rest period breaks, which by law you're required to have as an employee, but not as an independent contractor. So there's all these causes of action outside of workers' comp that you can bring in a civil lawsuit. I'm not going to shade on it, but we did see something similar with the Half Moon Bay shooting. 
you know, it was unfortunate that that situation like this happened, but they uncovered the living situation of all of the employees and the way they were being treated. And it was like opening up a can of worms. I think a lot of people just don't know their rights. Not everyone can spout off labor code sections and can tell you what an employee is versus an independent contractor. But a lot of people, they they don't. And, you know, there's a lot of immigrant workers in particular. You, you mentioned, you know, the Half Moon Bay shooting. There's a lot of people who work, you know, day labor or in farming, migrant workers, and they really get taken advantage of. They really don't know the difference. If you type something up that's related to a DIY at home or Mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to make a cake, you will find information out there. I see this a lot. We have undocumented workers as clients, and they have this fear that if I report the abuses my employer is doing, whether it's lack of workers' comp, misclassification, underpaying me, I'm going to get in trouble. I may get deported. There's going to be legal ramifications for me. And that's not true. The law is clearly designed in a way to protect everyone and the abuses of employers are unacceptable. It's on the employer to determine whether or not you should be working there legally and doing the proper paperwork. And if they don't, and they're just cutting corners and choose to abuse you, they're going to pay for it. Generally, it's one year for mixed classification issues with wage and hour violations. Those depend on the allegation. So usually for overtime, you can go back three years, pay stuff violations is a year. There's other causes of action, class actions, private attorney general act cases and such that are different as well. But generally, you have a couple of years for those things. Sooner than later, it's always better to talk to someone and figure out what you're entitled to. If you wait too long, it's often harder to get discovery done and pursue the case either way. As attorneys, we have an attorney-client privilege. And that privilege is one of the strongest afforded to people in the United States. The idea being that you could say you murdered someone and we're not allowed to to tell on you. If you have concerns about any potential unlawful conduct on your part, immigration, drugs, whatever the case may be, that is a privilege you have to consult with us in private that would not be disclosed. If you are hurt at work and you're being told you're an independent contractor, you know, definitely consult with a lawyer because there's a good chance you're probably an employee, you're probably entitled to workers' comp. And even if your employer's really shady and doesn't have comp insurance, there's still a remedy for you out there and we can get that for you. I would say it's very complex because there's document discovery subpoenas that we use. Oftentimes I'll take depositions of employee and employer witnesses. And more often than not, these cases go to trial. Unless you've done a trial before, (laughs) you can't just wing it. You have to submit exhibits, call witnesses, subpoena witnesses. You know, you have to be able to write trial briefs. If you lose, have to be able to write a successful appeal on your own. There are some work comp cases where sure, if someone's savvy enough and it's straightforward enough, maybe they can do it. But with this kind of thing, especially involving the UEF for the state's uninsured employers, that can be complicated. You have to understand what you're doing to be successful. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Work Comp Talk. One of the main questions we constantly get is settlements. Today's topic is frequently asked questions within settlements in the California workers' comp system. One of those questions is, how much am I going to get? (laughs) Settlements in California are kind of, to some extent, a little bit formulaic. The prime component of settlements is permanent disability, which means whatever functional limitations you can't have fixed through medical care ultimately are valued. And then that value is set by statute in California. The higher percentage in permanent disability you have, the higher your settlement's going to be. Correct. Yes. Sometimes there's different ways of coming up with permanent disability ratings. Some person may have a limited range of motion in their arm or shoulder, and that has a rating. Maybe they have a condition like a total knee replacement that also has an associated rating. They use what's called the AMA guides for rating impairment, and that's what doctors go by to assess the permanent rating for whatever body parts part of the case. I never worked for the IRS, but (laughs) that is how it is. Um, um, it's not included. No. Yeah. You have to declare it. You can't hide it. But you know, if you tell the bankruptcy trustee that, Hey, I've got this work comp settlement or it's coming and it's going to be X, Y, and Z dollars, it's usually excluded. And the reason is it really isn't designed as income. It's not some benefit you got. It's not something that you earned or worked for. It's designed to compensate you for medical issues. And the legislature deemed it reasonable that people shouldn't pay tax on money that should be allocated towards their injuries in medical care. The law changed, and you used to be able to plead 
sexual dysfunction, sleep disorders, and psychological issues secondary to having a physical injury. And so I want to be able to plead these things as compensable consequence injuries to my original physical injury. A lot of people are filing claims where it's like, you know, you cut your finger, it's all healed, but now you're claiming you're depressed, (laughs) you know, and like people are really stretching that and using that Mm. as a tool to work up the value of the cases. A lot of it was justified, but some of it wasn't. Also, there was some trading lobbying. At that same time, the permanent disability rates were increased. And so there was a bit of a trade-off where on the applicant side, they gave up the ability to file those types of claims for permanent disability purposes. There are exceptions to that. If your injury is caused by a violent act or it's catastrophic, you are allowed to collect pain and suffering, but it's in the form of psychological harm, meaning permanent disability and your future medical care for that component of the case. Utilization review is the insurance company's ability to review the treating physician's requests for authorization and say yes or no. Your doctor may say, hey, Carmen, you need shoulder surgery. Uh, You have a torn rotator cuff. The insurance company has doctors that look at it and say, you didn't even have an MRI yet, or you haven't tried injections, you haven't tried physical therapy. The doctor requesting authorization for surgery is too much too soon. We're going to deny it because it doesn't follow the treatment guidelines. And so at that point, the doctor is not allowed to do surgery for you. I mean, they can, but they're not going to get paid for it, which in practice means you're not getting it. Can't I sue for that? Can I sue the insurance company for additional benefits for taking forever to answer? And the answer is generally no. (laughs) There are ways to recoup penalties and sanctions. There is a statute uh, that you can actually succeed and recoup some monetary compensation within the workers' comp realm. But generally, you're not going to be able to file a, a civil lawsuit against the insurance company because of a legitimate denial of medical care that's by the rules that resulted in you having your condition be worse off than it would be otherwise. So when you settle a case, your doctor gives you permanent work restrictions. Once you're permanent and stationary, those are designed to help you operate in a capacity that's not gonna cause further injury. Your doctor is gonna say, hey, you know what? Your knees, you probably don't wanna be squatting and bending and stooping a lot, you know, and lifting a lot of weights. I'm gonna say you're gonna have a, a, a limitation on how much you should be standing, jumping, whatever. Same thing for your back or your shoulder, lifting requirements, those sorts of things. And those are designed to protect you. They're prophylactic in the sense that maybe you could do those things, but they're either going to hurt or at some point it's going to make things worse. There's a consequence. There's no rule. There's no law out there that says that you actually have to report those work restrictions to a new employer. You can choose to not abide by those work restrictions, but you're doing so at your own risk. I don't blame them. So I think the best thing here is it's at your own discretion, but know that you're also putting yourself at risk. Is it really worth it for you to blow out that knee and then be in some serious shit? In civil court, we had a system called Fast Track. When you file a civil lawsuit, you have a first case management conference. And generally speaking, the judge wants to assign dates for things like the mandatory settlement conference, as well as the trial. The goal for Fast Track is that 75% of all civil cases are tried within 18 months. We don't have that in workers' comp. It's kind of just go as you need to. A lot of these cases, there's a lot of stuff to work on, and it takes time. And oftentimes, the process is slow. If I request a hearing on an issue that I want set for trial, I have to file for a mandatory settlement conference. That takes 45 days maybe to get on to the court's calendar, sometimes longer. One of the last ones, which is another benefit that people are entitled to and sometimes are not even aware that they're entitled to, is the voucher. The voucher refers to what's called a supplemental job displacement benefit. The voucher is up to $6,000 in reimbursement for job retraining or education and associated costs like a laptop and things like that. If you're losing your job because of those permanent work restrictions, the insurance company is obligated to provide that to you. There's certain things that you can and can't use it for. You know, you can only use up to a thousand of it for a laptop. You're also getting, you can apply for something from the state called the return to work supplement. And California basically is acknowledging that, hey, $6,000 isn't that great for losing your job. That is a $5,000 supplemental payment that you get from the state um, if you've lost your job.